what I'm going to do is just uh, a number of things. I'll give uh, an introduction, a little background on Gandhi. Then I'll talk a little bit about uh, just a few words on Gandhi and Trump. And then um, talk a little bit about Gandhi on morality, Gandhi on truth. Then the main thing, I'll talk about Gandhi on nonviolence, ahimsa, since he was the most influential modern proponent of nonviolence. Then I may just say a little bit about certain very difficult contradiction that's going on right now with Trump and in the US, and, uh, and then end a little bit about uh, Gandhi's view of human nature and the need for uh, a radical paradigm shift in dealing with the various crises that we encounter. So in way of introduction, let me just ask you, how many of you, uh, how many of you have seen the 19, early 1980s famous movie Gandhi, right? Richard Attenborough with Ben Kingsley. Okay, most of you have. I got most people actually, that's their major introduction and knowledge of Gandhi, that movie, which really uh, did the most to uh, publicize Gandhi in the West. Uh, how many of you have uh, some other exposure through reading, through, you know, you know something about Gandhi. Okay, quite a few, so I'm gonna have to be careful with this audience, right? I can't get away with just alternative facts, and uh, I can't tell you like Gandhi was born in the Lower East Side of New York, and he, he always admired uh, American exceptionalism and uh, US capitalism, so okay, I'll have to, even though it looks like quite an informed uh, group here. Uh, I think I'm going to challenge you, everyone here, some more than others, and uh, present a Gandhi that, or, that you may not be familiar with. Okay, so I think we'll then have really good discussion. So let me just give you a very brief, just a little biography, not much on Gandhi. Uh, Gandhi, his name was Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, M.K. Gandhi. As Stan said, he later was given the honorific title Mahatma, great soul, great self, spiritual, moral self. Uh, he was born in October 2nd, uh, 1869 in Porbando, Gujarat, which is on the west coast of India and the Arabian Sea. Um, that day, October 2nd, is a national holiday in India, and it was selected a number of years ago by the UN General Assembly that that day, October 2nd, is the International Day of Nonviolence. Um, and uh, Gandhi, I'll just give you a little bit. Gandhi uh, was a um, member of, in terms of the uh, Indian caste system, at least the best known forecast. Uh, Gandhi was not a Brahmin or even a Chhatri. He was in the third caste, which are the Vaishyas, the caste of uh, what were farmers, merchants, business people. Okay? And Gandhi's particular background, he was part of the most uh, community in that area of Gujarat which were part of the subcaste, the Bania subcaste. India, in, in India, there are really hundreds and hundreds of subcastes called Jati, and most people function in terms of those subcastes. And so Gandhi was part of the Bania, particular form of it, subcaste, which were basically business people, merchants, uh, money lenders, Gandhi's name himself, the name Gandhi means grocer, a grocery, means grocer, and that goes back at some point. It's a common name in, in Gandhi's background. His, he had a relatively privileged, probably you could say middle class background. His father, uh, Karamchand Gandhi, or Kaba, was uh, often described as the prime minister of that State And that's a deceptive name. The name was Diwan, which is an Arabic name, a Divan. 
And the divan was, uh, was like financial head, political head. And so what Gandhi's father and grandfather, too, were, they were the kind of political head prime, of these tiny little princely states. India had hundreds and hundreds of princely states, and that was partly how the British ruled India through divide and conquer. So Gandhi's father was the political head of these small uh, princely states in that area of Gujarat. Uh, Gandhi's mother, whom he admired the most, his mother was actually very religious, very devout. And uh, they were, uh, in that area, followers of Lord Vishnu. Gandhi's favorite god is uh, Ram, Lord Ram. Uh, he also greatly admired, who's an incarnation, an avatar of Vishnu. And he also, of course, greatly admired Krishna, who's another incarnation of Vishnu. Gandhi's favorite text is the Bhagavad Gita, in which uh, uh, the central deity there and the charioteer is uh, Krishna. The, uh, so, Gandhi had that kind of a background. Uh, he admired his mother, her religious devotion. She would undergo all these fasts, these kind of spiritual fasts. Uh, this all played a big part in Gandhi. So uh, what I can just say briefly is he was, uh, his mother was actually the fourth wife of Karamchand. The three previous wives had died. And so this was the fourth, and he, uh, she had four children. He had two older brothers, an older sister. He was the young, youngest of them. And then he, uh, he himself, Gandhi himself, had four sons. It's very controversial what happened with his sons. But he had four sons, especially the oldest one. Very controversial. There's a lot of debate about that. Uh, Gandhi went, just very briefly, he went to England. It was very controversial. He defied all of the caste. His subcaste banned him from leaving. Uh, uh, but he went to England for three years. He became a, ban a barrister, a lawyer. Went through a lot of changes in England, right? Uh, became a vegetarian, became uh, by commitment. He first, he had never read. He wasn't religious. He first read the Bhagavad Gita when he was in England. At the urging of certain Christians and theosophists who wanted him to share that with them, and then he went, he came back to India, he went to South Africa for almost 22 years. Had all these formative experiences in South Africa, came back in 1915, and uh, spent roughly the last 32 years of his life in India. And uh, he was assassinated uh, uh, January 30th. Uh, 1948, about six months after India gained independence. A horrible time during partition. Probably a million people were slaughtered through communal violence, right? And, and Gandhi's last period in his life, for me, is the most remarkable. It's just incredible. Here's a guy who was 76, 77, 78. Where did he? And he was depressed about what was going on, and yet he had this incredible energy. I read a lot about it. where did he, uh, you know, and fearlessness. Uh, so I've tried to understand what, how was he able to tap into such incredible creative energy that allowed him in, uh, to struggle and, and in many ways to be quite successful late in his life. Okay, so that's just a little background. There are many tributes to Gandhi. Gandhi often is described as the most admired human being of the last century. And he always ranks near the top, not just in India, but internationally. And, uh, you know, there are famous tributes to Gandhi. Albert Einstein has the most famous one. When Gandhi turned 70, Einstein said, generations to come will scarce believe that ever such a one in flesh and blood ever walked upon this earth. And then I can just give you one other guy, Einstein quote, which I think is uh, 
pretty powerful. Einstein wrote, I believe that Gandhi's views were the most enlightened of all the political men in our time. We should strive to do things in, this, in his spirit, not to use violence in fighting for our cause, but by non-participation in anything you believe is evil. And of course, just to give you one other, as you know, uh, Martin Luther King, in, uh, in, in his first book, Stride Towards Freedom, about the Montgomery bus boycott experience, King has a section called his pilgrimage to nonviolence. And King writes that Gandhi was the major influence on King's philosophy of nonviolence and his method of nonviolence. King says, um, just to give you, uh, I think, a str strong quote there, Gandhi was probably the first person in history to lift the love of Jesus above mere interaction between individuals to a powerful and effective social force on a large scale. And then King continues, just to give you uh, the ending, if humanity is to progress, Gandhi is inescapable. He lived, thought, and acted inspired by the vision of humanity evolving towards a world of peace and harmony. We may ignore him at our own risk. Okay, so having given you these tributes, uh, I want to emphasize Gandhi during his lifetime up to today was always controversial. And in India as well, he remains to this day uh, very controversial. And just to mention, there are many powerful Indians today who are totally anti-Gandhi in their whole approach. The, uh, the most influential of those are these modern westernized Indians, the ones who are uh, and who are now billionaires, multimillionaires. These are people who know business, they're CEOs of big corporations, they have interlocking relationships with our elite. These are people who are advanced scientists, do top work in medicine, engineering, their work is at the level of our top people. In fact, many of them went to MIT and places like that. Uh, so, for these modern westernized uh, Indians, Gandhi is irrelevant. Or at worst, he's an irritant. He raises things that they, they want to silence. It makes them a little uncomfortable. Then you have very different, right now, the political power and the uh, groups, the in power are these Hindutva, right-wing, militarized Hindu nationalist, right? And uh, some of their appeal is not unlike what we've experienced in this country now, this kind of xenophobic, Hindu superiority, India first, uh, we want to be the sh militarily the strongest nuclear power, and uh, and the danger is the Muslims, the Dalits, the untouchables, these on and on, these people who are the enemies, who weaken us and can't be trusted and so on. So there are a lot of powerful Hindu nationalist forces, and in fact, they're, in the, gov they're the ruling government right now. They really, it's interesting, on the one hand, they hate Gandhi. Gandhi's a traitor. Gandhi loved Muslims more than Hindus. Gandhi's responsible for a partition. He's responsible for Kashmir. Now, though, in the present atmosphere, what they often want to do is appropriate Gandhi. This is all changed. Gandhi is a great Hindu, <laughs> right? But what they do is they package a Gandhi that's very different from Gandhi himself, what he was like. And then, of course, just one last example. I'm giving, there are a lot of these people who are Dalits, who Gandhi called Hari John's children of God, and so forth, who are very followers of Ambedkar, 
who was a very influential Indian, who in fact went to Columbia, came back, he's the main architect of the Indian Constitution, he's an untouchable. He wound up late in his life totally trashing Hinduism. Hinduism is casteist, it will always oppress untouchables. He converted to Buddhism very late in his life. While there are a lot of followers of Ambedkar and other Dalit leaders in India who in fact are very anti-Gandhi and they think Gandhi was hierarchical and that uh, he uh, was not a friend. So all of this is very debatable, but I just want to mention that Gandhi himself is quite controversial and quite controversial for us today. Okay, now one thing I'll mention that I find a lot of people do well-intentioned uh, in India and also here in the West is they th either supporters of Gandhi or critics of Gandhi, they have a very oversimplified view of Gandhi that can be packaged in terms of a few slogans, which are usually very nice inspirational slogans the kind that you see on posters, even corporate posters I find increasingly, bumper stickers. They turn Gandhi into a kind of hallmark greeting card, right? And it be the change you want in the world. Uh, and um, uh, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. And uh, uh, there's enough for everyone's need, but not for anyone's greed. Or God, God has no religion. You know, people like that. The problem with this is that it becomes, people think, okay, I've got the Gandhi blueprint or recipe. I just have to apply it. Like, what's happening in our country with all these issues or in the world? And you get the Gandhi answer. Like, what would Gandhi tell us to do? What is this, you know, like this? And the reason, there's a lot of truth to that, but the problem with it is it oversimplifies and distorts Gandhi. The real Gandhi is someone, he has these values, he struggles, he gets depressed. He often, it's really hard to solve these crises. And at the end of his life, he considers himself a failure. Some of these issues he worked on for 30, 40 years, he thinks that he failed as he looks at all the violence, the communal killings, the untouchability, so many of these, the uh, even oppression of women, the sexism, all the stuff. He had very limited, he himself feels that he had limited success. Many of his experiments in life, he says, were failed experiments in truth. And he's trying to learn from these failed experiences. So Gandhi, I find, is very nuanced. He, he always tells us to simplify our life, but it's not so easy to simplify your life. It's a very difficult thing to do. And he, and he doesn't say simple living is, you know, uh, the way it's often taken and the way he's attacked. Gandhi says simple living is high living. By simplifying your life, you're going to raise your st real standard of living. What does that mean? And how does one do that, living in the kind of society, uh, how we're socialized, educated, and so forth? Okay, so that's a little bit on Gandhi. So let me just say then, I'm just going to say a few words on this one. Gandhi and Trump. And then you'll see throughout, as I go through, What's interesting, when I thought of Gandhi, his values, his personality, his principles, his goals, you can outline those. It's not just that they are different from Trump's. It's not just, they're like mirror images. Mirror, they are diametrically opposed, right? It's such a clear contrast in every way. So Gandhi would be very alarmed by what's going on during the campaign since then. I mean, when he looks at Trump's personality, his personal qualities, the, uh, his language, the language he uses, his actions, his, all his priorities, Gandhi would be totally alarmed. 
you would say these are based on greed, they're um, immoral, they're untruthful, they're violent, they're all of these things. I'll mention some of that. But, so you'll see as I go through Gandhi, a number of these things on Gandhi, often I won't have to even say it. You'll just think of Trump or the values we're getting from Washington and other sources of power, and you'll just see it so clearly that they're diametrically opposed to what Gandhi is uh, proposing. Okay? Uh, I'll throw out one thing that's controversial. That I just want to say it, that uh, because a lot of our friends right now are really good people who are involved. They're involved in something Gandhi would be quite critical of. Even though these are some of our best peace and justice and activists, healthcare activists, all kinds of. And what they're doing, what they're saying is, you know, we can learn from the Tea Party. Whereas the point is, how do you win? That's what's important. And they showed us how you win. And we, Indivisible, all these groups are doing such good work right now. And what they're doing is, they're saying we can use the same methods to be effective. Gandhi himself would be quite nervous by that because what Gandhi would say is, uh, and I'll go through a little bit in a few minutes, is that uh, you should not lower your standards so much. That in fact, uh, it's very dangerous. You'll see in different ways to just say in some way the ends justify the means. And uh, so you'll see Gandhi would have quite of a critique, I'll go through a few things with that, in terms of what a lot of good activists are doing right now. And uh, he would want to raise certain Gandhian values in challenging some of that. Okay, so let's then look at, let me say a little bit about morality, just briefly. For Gandhi, Morality is the basis of life. Gandhi has a philosophy in which ethics is first philosophy. It's the foundation of philosophy. Gandhi is mainly a moralist. Gandhi is mainly concerned with how do you live a moral life? That's his most important thing he's concerned. Not abstract arguments or proofs or any of this. That's a, what he wants to know is, are you a person who lives a virtuous life? Do you have character? That's what he wants to know. And so, uh, for example, today is the uh, commencement, both up at University of Maine, where we are, and I think today here at USM was the commencement. Gandhi wrote a lot about this on education. And Gandhi would say, uh, okay, here are all these graduates today. They acquired a lot of knowledge in a lot of different areas. Well, based on their education here, are they better people? Do they have character? Was that part of their education? Do they care about other suffering beings? Right? Are they dedicated to selfless service in which they use their technology, their knowledge, their science, their myth, in order to meet the needs of people who are suffering. Gandhi says otherwise, he's very strong on this. Without that moral basis, Gandhi says this is miseducation. It's not even education. Gandhi says if you have knowledge, knowledge is a kind of power. And if you don't have moral values, it's very dangerous. You know, Gandhi was alive when we dropped the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He wrote a lot about that as did Einstein. This danger of people who have, sir, they have a power and it's not grounded in uh, any kind of moral values, okay? So for Gandhi, through all, all of this, Gandhi would be very disturbed looking at Trump and his people, who he, he in all ways, in language and tactics and actions and so forth. He would say not only is there no, it's not informed in any way, by Gandhi and morality, it's just the opposite. Okay, so let me then develop a little bit. Gandhi uh, uh, says uh, truth. 
Uh, people often forget this, although Stan gave a famous quote from it, from Gandhi, on truth. Uh, Gandhi has this view of truth, is satya. Satya is from the Sanskrit, the way he uses it. Sat, satya means that which exists, being, being, what is real. Okay, so what does this mean? Gandhi says, Gandhi is kind of fearless. Gandhi says you should follow truth no matter where it takes you. This is uh, in his experiments with truth. You should follow truth no matter where it takes you. And Gandhi's opposed to what he thinks is the modern, post-medieval, Western political, economic, social, and so on, view that the ends justify the means. Gandhi thinks this is very dangerous because then you can use any means to achieve your end. And he says, look at what exploitation, oppression, sexism, racism, environmental destruction, militarization. You can justify all of these things in terms of the ends justify the means. So Gandhi would be totally opposed to this. We'll see. And for Gandhi, your means have to be just as moral, truthful, nonviolent, kind, loving, and so as your ends. Okay? And so what Gandhi, looking at the Trump era, now what we're seeing, it's not just that this is a kind of mirror in, image for him. I mean, even in that Western tradition, Trump has such narrow ends. The end is basically winning. That's what got winning <laughs> at any cost. And winning is defined in such a narrow way. It's defined in the most crude, narrow way. Cutting that deal, winning, getting rich, getting your, it's the way he ran his corporations and so forth. So for Gandhi, even within that Western tradition, uh, this approach is so blatantly untruthful as well as immoral, violent, and so forth. So what Gandhi basically said, it's interesting. Gandhi equates truth with God, self with a capital S, soul with a capital S, uh, and in many other terms. And what Gandhi says, he says, I started out, I used to say, God is truth because that's the traditional position. This is an attribute of God. God is truth, just as God is love, God is mercy, God is creator, God is redeemer, whatever those attributes are. Gandhi says, I changed. And now I reverse the whole thing. What I say is truth is God. For those who are religious believers and believe in God, right, then truth it's good. You can follow truth however you see. And so he advises Muslims, Christians, others. He says, well, if your view of reality is in terms of God, then truth is God for you. But Gandhi says there are many people who don't have that view of God. They are just as concerned with truth as anyone else. Gandhi wants to appeal to Jains. It's an ancient spiritual Indian position. It had tremendous influence on Gandhi on nonviolence, non-possessiveness, many values. Gandhi wants to appeal to Jains who don't have a god. Buddhists don't have a god. He wants to appeal to Buddhists. Original Buddhism, the Pali Canon, is either atheistic or at most agnostic. There's no god there. Uh, Gandhi wants to apply to appeal to socialists, to communists, to humanists, to people who are good people. They have a sense of morality, right? truthful living. So Gandhi wants this view of truth to be as inclusive as possible. And then what he says is, so uh, for Gandhi, just very briefly, Gandhi has a holistic view of reality, the interconnectedness of all of life. And Gandhi says he experienced, he says, I experienced this truth, this power with a capital P, there's this force, love force, truth force, soul force. It's described in many ways. There's this force that we experience that brings us together in interconnected, meaningful wholes. 
to live a harmonious life in our relation to ourselves, to others, to other species, to nature. So Gandhi has this view of the, it's a moral force, a spiritual force that basically binds us in terms of a sense of unity, unity with the respect for difference, but our basic unity uh, with all of life. And Gandhi, uh, so, uh, Gandhi says no one has absolute truth of this. You are a finite, limited, relative, embodied human being, so at most you have glimpses. No one has the absolute truth, right? No one has the absolute truth. Right? So, uh, and we're always moving in this world from one relative truth to greater relative truth. Hopefully closer to the ideal we have. Okay, so this is Gandhi's view. That's why you should be tolerant. Other people have truths you don't have. Not only that, you can learn from other truths. That's why Gandhi says, I can accept the truths of, uh, let's say, in the Sermon on the Mount as he saw it. I can accept the certain truths from all kinds of different traditions, and that makes me a better Hindu. That's how I become a better Hindu. So that's Gandhi. So that's a little bit on that. Now, the next topic, which is the main one I'll give you, is uh, his view of ahimsa, nonviolence, because this is where he's the most remarkable and where it really challenges today what we're experiencing, which is the opposite. So, Gandhi, for Gandhi, violence, and the challenge is this. Gandhi would say, most of us say we're nonviolent, or we believe in nonviolence. Even if we qualify it, usually we say, war is awful, but sometimes it's necessary for peace. <laughs> right? Uh, and we, each of these, we qualify it, right? We say, nonviolence is better than violence. But sometimes we have to use violence to stand up in the name of nonviolence. You can go through all these things. Gandhi says that is that most people who say, who profess that they are for nonviolence, they're actually very violent or complicit with violence. So how can Gandhi say this? So violence means violence is a force. Everyone grants that. It's a force. On the first level, it's a force that's fierce, that's rough, that's intense, okay? And some people who accept that just say, yeah, and it's necessary in dealing with the issues. You know, that force is, a, that violent force is not just necessary, it's often good, right? Then uh, you have a second meaning of violence, which is a force not only that's fierce, that's rough, but in fact it involves assault, infringement, violation. It has a very negative meaning. So Gandhi accepts both of those meanings, and nonviolence is an alternative to that. So what Gandhi would say is this, uh, for nonviolence is an active force. He's very different from a lot of other proponents who say, oh, nonviolence is just refraining from violence. It's passive. Just, I'm not going to be violent. That's not Gandhi. For Gandhi, nonviolence is an active force. In fact, he thinks it's just as active as violence. In fact, he thinks it's the strongest force. So nonviolence is a force, is an active force. Right? You have to put into action and to practice. Then Gandhi says this. The first level that most people restrict when they talk about violence and nonviolence is what you could call overt. Overt violence. Basically overt physical violence. Okay? And Gandhi said, yeah, like it's not hard to get people to agree to things like just killing is bad. Torture is bad. Rape is bad. Certain kinds of domestic violence are bad. Certain kinds of bullying are bad, right? And so you can get people. Gandhi doesn't dismiss that. In fact, Gandhi encountered that overt violence many times in his life, and finally he was assassinated. 
by someone in an act, obviously, of overt violence. Uh, but Gandhi says 90% of violence is not overt physical violence. So Gandhi really deepens and broadens our understanding of violence and nonviolence. And in my work, I've done it in two main ways. Gandhi says violence and nonviolence are multidimensional, multidimensional. So you don't just have physical overt violence, but, for example, you have inner violence, psychological violence. Gandhi says hate is violence, love is nonviolence. So for Gandhi, you could be a person who's full of hate, and maybe you don't commit an overt action, but you're a very violent person. And that will be reflected in how you relate to yourself, to other people, to nature, okay? So we have inner violence. Gandhi, surprisingly, because he's a moral, spiritual, right, person, Gandhi spends more time on economic violence than any other kind of violence. He's not above it, like a lot of that Indian tradition renounces, oh, that's a lower level of living, right, the person. No. For Gandhi, Gandhi says even you want to find God. Gandhi has many passages. He's all over the place. He's very eclectic. But basically, Gandhi says you want to find God. Don't look up there. Look right here in how people are living their lives in this world. And when you identify with the people who are living under poverty, who are the most exploited, the most disadvantaged, have the least freedom, when you identify with them and you engage in selfless service to meet their needs, that's where God appears for Gandhi. It's a very existential view. So Gandhi says basically economic violence is exploitation, as he used it, exploitation. Gandhi says you cannot have wealth, economic power concentrated in the hands of the few, and have nonviolence. In fact, Gandhi, we have all this growing inequality in the US, it's incredible, and throughout the world. Gandhi says you cannot have inequality and have nonviolence or truth. It's impossible, right? So, in fact, Gandhi says you cannot have economic violence in this asymmetrical, hierarchical, concentration of economic power, industrial, financial, all kinds of forms of power in the hands of a few and have democracy. He says it's impossible, right? So there's a lot there to think about. But what Gandhi is basically saying in economic violence is uh, we have to oppose the kind of concentration of wealth economic power and so forth, in the hands of the few, who then are able to relate to those who don't have those economic means in a very violent way, through exploitation, oppression, denial of health care, denial of education, denial, all these things we're talking about today. Okay? Then Gandhi talks about cultural violence. He talks about something now that's so common. He talks a lot about religious violence. Religions are very violent, very violent. Not just holy wars and inquisitions and overt jihads, certain things, certain forms it takes. But in fact, Gandhi says religions, institutional religions, tend to be very hierarchical. They usually are very patriarchal and sexist. They're very classist, casteist, all these things. He says, if you're a religious person, you have to struggle within your own religion to try to expose and resist all those impurities in your own religion. Okay? Then Gandhi says, okay, we have educational violence. Right? The British colonial system of education was a violent system. It educated Indians to believe what's Western, what's British, and so on, is best. And to be ashamed of their own Hindu culture, Indian culture, right? All these, that there's violence to people, okay? Then 
and environmental violence. Gandhi is very good. A lot of environmentalists today, some of the famous ones, were very influenced by Gandhi. Uh, and so, again, uh, so what Gandhi is saying in terms of multidimensional violence is we're socialized, right? We're always, you always have to contextualize for Gandhi. You have to contextualize. And we're socialized, educated, and sort of in a way that all these dimensions of violence interact with each other. Linguistic violence. Gandhi says, how do you speak to the two, three, four-year-old? It's through language acquisition that we form a lot of our views of ourself, our world, the other. So, through linguistic, economic, psychological, political, religious, cultural, all these different dimensions of violence interact with each other. They reinforce each other. So, basically, the result is that we live in a violent world and we conceive of ourselves and others in very violent terms. So Gandhi's project in that regard is how you begin to educate, raise consciousness about all these dimensions of violence, and then it's like a law of karma for Gandhi. How do you, right, everything in this world is caused and conditioned. Nothing is absolute in this world for Gandhi. Everything is caused and conditioned, and then it becomes a new causal conditioning factor. So what Gandhi's interested, his project is, how do you break that vicious cycle of violence? How do you begin to introduce nonviolent factors? Like if you can produce love and kindness rather than hatred, being concerned about the suffering of others rather than ego, it drives attachments and so forth, narrow, selfish views, and on and you begin to substitute nonviolent factors, this will gradually have an effect, right? And it's gradual. It's gradual. You know, you don't say, I'm no longer going to be violent. Gandhi says every human being is violent just by living. Gandhi himself says he's violent. You can't, it's part of our human mode of being. But you can be conscious, aware of it, and you can cut down on your violence and substitute nonviolence. The other term that I've used for Gandhi on violence and nonviolence is the structural violence of the status quo. This is business as usual. It's when the system is working smoothly. There's no disruption. People aren't rising up and protesting. There are no demonstrations. system is just working smoothly. Gandhi says our economic system is violent. Our political system is violent, and, and so forth, each of these. So, the, for example, Gandhi's saying the fact that people, poor people, people who are exploited, people who, uh, let's say, are uh, raped, people who, the fact that they suffer silently for all kinds of reasons and don't protest, either out of fear, because other people have power over their lives, or because religion tells them, if you just don't protest, you'll go to heaven, life will be better in the next world, or you'll be reborn to a higher rebirth. And or you relate to it through alcohol, through drugs, through all kinds of escapist things. For Gandhi, you know, that maintains the status of the violence, right? The violent status quo, the structural violence. Of, so, when you put those two together, you can see you have a very different view of violence and nonviolence. So, that's some of the challenge. Then, let me just, um, there, are, there are a lot of things I can say on that, but I think uh, I'm going to, because of time, I realize that once I get going, I always forget about time, because I have a good time. So, uh, I just looked down and I so actually, so what I'm going to just tell you is uh, there are a lot of big challenges to Gandhi, what I said just now on truth, violence, nonviolence, and we may want to get into uh, some controversial things. Uh, in my writing, because people always ask, what would Gandhi do about Hitler? And it's not hypothetical. 
Gandhi was involved in What would he do about 9-11? What would he do about, uh, yeah, all these things, you can give all these again. What would he do even about the person being raped? No, no one wants to engage in dialogue with him. He's not given the chance to touch the heart of the other, transform. He's not willing simply, if I don't strike back, but I absorb the suffering, this has incredible transformative effect, which it does, but doesn't work. So we can get into that because Gandhi actually says, under some circumstances, violence, although it's always horrible, violence is, not, is allowed. There are some circumstances where people are surprised where you don't have a nonviolent alternative and certain kind of violent response may be the most nonviolent thing you can do. So we may get into that. And Gandhi's strength in terms of preventative nonviolence, something I won't go through now, but that's his greatest strength in dealing with all these crises that we have today. Uh, not when the violence explodes, what do you do? But in fact, what do you do ahead of time to avoid that, to deal with the basic root causes and conditions that give rise to all of this violence in the world? So what I'll just say two other things. One is I was going to talk about certain contradictions in the United States today. And that if I've tried to sort through and then relate Gandhi, like what's going on in Washington, corporate America, and Trump, and these kind of antithetical things. On the one hand, as seen in the Steve Bannons and Steve, uh, Stephen Miller and Sebastian Gorka and these people around, and in Trump himself, this kind of, uh, you know, vicious, violent, xenophobic, um, populist nationalism, America first, make America great. We are, we are this exceptional, who sold us out? Who are, what weakened us? And it's these immigrants and people of color and, and uh, foreigners and, and, you know, and on and on. So you all know that, which helped them to get elected. They really keyed into the, the anger that a lot of white working class people felt, and for good objective reasons. And on the other hand, Trump the billionaire, right? The, the model of the top one of the one percent, who appoints the rich, richest cabinet and appointees in human history. Billionaire CEOs of you know, Exxon, Mobil, you know, all these, he's, these are people he's appointing. The globalist, <laughs> the people, the part of the military industrial complex who like to, like Trump himself, hire cheap labor to also outsource things, to maximize their profits. They don't think that's crony capitalism selling out America. So how do we sort these two tendencies of what continues to come out of Washington? And if you want, you know, I did bring copies of our recent Main Peace Action Committee newsletter. This is, we've done this, this is volume 42. And this is mainly students I work with. But I have an article a little different in here called Marx, Karl Marx, Gandhi. And, uh, and the post-election uh, in the US and in the world. And so there I actually have about a, a number of pages talking about those kinds. There just is less Gandhi in this article, but then I'm giving you like, I get very little nonviolence in here. But you know, I welcome you to take this. I brought some for you. So let me just end with one thing and then we'll open it up. So Gandhi, People often attack Gandhi, and they say, it's interesting, they say, you know, even if they admire, boy, he's a very moral, spiritual person, the Mahatma, it's incredible. But he's got a false view of human nature. That's not what people are like. Now, I find this interesting in all my courses over the years. You know, I, I have students, when we're dealing with all kinds of different topics, They'll raise their hand and they'll say, 
that sounds good, whatever it is. It's just not human nature. You know what they mean in every single case? Not one of them has ever meant when they say it's not human nature, human beings are kind, <laughs> loving, <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, any of that. What they mean is people are greedy. I'm number one. I'm just out for myself. I am, uh, you know, that kind of view. That's what they mean by you. So how does Gandhi deal with this? Because people say, look, all these spiritual, moral values of truth and nonviolence, morality, all this stuff. Yeah, that'd be nice. We wish the world were like that. That's a kind of utopian view. It's not the real world in which we're living. To some extent, that's true. Here's, I'll just end by telling you, because I think Gandhi's very interesting. Gandhi doesn't deny that that is part of our human nature. Gandhi knows that. He's around the most awful things. He's experienced the most awful things. So Gandhi says that is part of being human being. For thousands and thousands of years, we have that. And in India's history, world history, that's part of being human. But what Gandhi calls that is our lower nature, our base nature. He got some of this from Tolstoy, some of this wording. He says, that is human beings when they are less developed in realizing their human potential. But we also have a higher nature, this more moral, spiritual nature, in which when we see other people suffering, it moves us. It moves us when other people are suffering. We want to do something about it. Right? That's what a good family is. That's what a good friendship is. That's what a good community is. Gandhi says, so we have all of these examples every single day of people who respond with kindness, with love, <laughs> with compassion, with all these Gandhian values. Now, what Gandhi says is, if human beings were simply that lower human nature, we would have been extinct long ago. We would have been extinct. What has allowed us to survive and flourish is because we can realize this higher human potential for what it is to be human. And when you look at the world, Gandhi says, and it's even more now than when he was alive, it's also pragmatic. If we don't change those values, we're not going to survive. We're at the tipping point or beyond the tipping point. We live in a world that's economically unsustainable, that's environmentally unsustainable, and on and on. So for just practical reasons, we're saying we're at that point, as now all these climate change people very much are saying, we have to change some of our basic human values qualitatively, our way of relating what is success? What is the good life? What is it to live a meaningful life? Okay, so this is what Gandhi's basic challenge, right? And, uh, and Gandhi thinks it's not simply utopian. It's on a certain level, it's very practical. Gandhi thinks we just, our system, our dominant system, hierarchical system of power kind of marginalizes that. It's always focusing on the rich and famous, the powerful, the people, the, like they determine history. And Gandhi says, no, that, that's disempowering for the rest of us. You know, that's not what it is. We shape history, and we have to be active. We have to be activated, put these values into practice. We have to educate ourselves. We have to resist as much nonviolently as possible, and we have to create positive alternatives to the dominant values that we have, and we can do that. So I threw a lot at you, and uh, why don't, I'd love to have good questions, interactions. Why don't we just open it up to feedback from you? Yeah.